Uneducated, unfiltered, unhinged. This is the Mangina Dialogues. We at it again with your host, Nick Scopes and the Gregolicious. You know how we do, cause you know we keeping it gangster and silly. Unplugged like a fool swung titty. About get jitty, cause you know we down to the nitty and the gritty. And we make shit sound so damn pretty. Yeah, cause this unhinged comedy. And right now you're in the mix, so get ready. Cause we bout to get it poppin'. We ain't stopping. I'm educated, I'm filtered on him. Hello and welcome to the Mangina Dialogues. I am your host, Nick Scopes. And I am Academy Award winner, uh, the Gregalicious. <laughs> what a moron. And our guest today is the co producer and director of the documentary on HBO Max called Class Action Park. Seth Porges, how are you, my man? I'm excited to be here. So am I, dude. Dude, I, so let me just get right into it and say, so Greg grew up in New Jersey and he knew about this, and he's a lot older than I am. So <laughs> I wasn't really around yep. when all. Greg, do you have any scars? Do you have any? I, any mental, like I have mental scars, like mental scars. many <laughs> mental scars. Did you make it? Did you Did you go to Action Park? Me? Yeah. Oh my God. I yes, I went to Action yes. Park so many times as a kid. Yeah, on uh, it's all true, right? It's oh my true. god, it is so. It's yeah. so funny watching this documentary. I'm like, I got to get in touch with this guy or, or these guys, and because watching it brought back so many memories, I completely blocked out. Right. Yeah, I think and, we need like a trigger warning if from the tri state area. Like we have people who are literally like, I, 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 I feel like I need therapy now. Like it's yeah. it, it brings it all back. It brings it all back. <laughs> it's it's why. And I was trying to explain it to Nick. I'm like Nick. Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen Greg get so passionate about something. He's like, dude, let me tell you, there was this amusement park back in the day. People were fucking dying, and you could do whatever you want. And I was like, okay, and that's why you went, and you went <laughs> yes. because of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I. That's why I honestly, you went. And it's funny, like you know, I've had a, a few friends I've seen on Facebook who you know are younger and posted like, have you seen this? documentary class action park do i know anybody that actually is alive that went to that place and i'm like yep you sure did <laughs> and the whole uh, the whole state of new jersey right now is just bragging to north yeah. dakota to california yep. to everybody they're like See, i told you i told you <laughs> this isn't a mirage this shit exists yeah so yeah i i'll tell you how it started so i my dad was a, a sports agent when I grew up and we would always find our way to these weird like hotels for different conventions or meetings or whatever. So when the Playboy Club in Vernon Valley existed, I was there as a child, right? I have vivid memories of sitting in the lounge with my mom and dad with the Playboy bunnies running around and being like, where the fuck am I? Right, like the middle of it, nowhere, just this Playboy club in the, in the middle in of nowhere. The middle of nowhere, out of the woods, yeah. comes the Playboy Club, right? And I wasn't even really old enough to know what the Playboy Mansion, a Playboy magazine was, but I'm in this Playboy Club and there's naked women rolling around with bunny ears. It's like I'm dreaming, right? So I was going there since then, and I was explaining to Nick, I'm like, then it turned, then they built, then there was a ski resort, and then out of nowhere is the most dangerous place that ever existed in the world for children to go and be unsupervised. Yes, run by children too. Run by children. And run by children. It's it's like if you were let wild in like in a real time Willy Wonka, like if that yeah. really existed, that's what Action Park was. <laughs> Yeah, and you could actually like fall into that chocolate river and never be seen from again. Exactly. You know, like <laughs> like there's no oompa loompas taking you away, but it's all it's all there. Yeah. So I, I I'm curious what like you I imagine you grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in the D.C. area, but I did go to Action Park. I made it up there. My dad's from Jersey. We were big okay. like amusement theme park family. Uh, so I went to all of them. You know, Universal, Disney, then yep. Action Park. Action Park was different. Just. The second you walk up to yeah. it, you see this giant loop to loop water slide. And it's like, like a, instead of a castle from like Sleeping Beauty's castle, Disneyland, you see a looping water slide. Yeah. And from that moment, you're like, this is not real. This is weird. Like I drew that in my napkin. Like it just feels like something ripped from your six-year-old imagination come to life. Yeah. It, it really does. And it, it's really a shame that Nick never got a chance to experience. Sorry, Nick. 
<laughs> I never went. I've done like they had alpine slides at other Difference. parks, but not as yeah. dangerous, I would assume. <laughs> but no, I never everything at yeah, Action Park had like versions of things you'd see elsewhere, but it was just kind of cranked up a little. Like instead of go-karts, they had 60 mile per hour racing cars. Yeah. Instead of like bumper boats, they had speed boats that you could crash and land into a snake infested pond. Like it's like the version oh. you'd see somewhere else, but like times 10. It was like the real Jungle Cruise at Disney World. I mean, at, uh, oh, yeah. at Disney World. Um, and it's funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because I also grew up going to Disney World, and we would stay on that hotel on property that had the speedboats that you would go out and drive these little pussy speedboats around the lagoon, right? That maybe went like 10 miles an hour. So you're in this speedboat. You're thinking, this is the coolest thing ever. You're driving this little speedboat, like puttering around like a, a shitty golf cart. And then... Um, on the summer, we'd go to Action Park, you get in the speedboat, and it's like fucking boom. It's like <laughs> you could take off. <laughs> it's and the best. crash into people. There's no, yeah. it's like, you know, when you go to Disney World, you get to the end of Pirates of the Caribbean. Nobody's like high-fiving, like we made it to the end of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> like every ride at Action Park, it felt like a feat that you survived it. It was all these yeah. like effectively extreme sports masquerading as children's rides. Right. So like what brought you to this? Like what, like how did you come to make this? Yeah. So I, I went to the park a couple times as a kid and I had these memories and it's like that, there's no way that's real. It didn't square with my concept as I got older of how the world works, you know, right. that like this shouldn't be allowed to happen. There's no way this was real. So I became really interested in just kind of investigating both my memories and then as I started looking into things all the urban legends and, and rumors that you would read about Action Park the whole thing kind of became this myth of like a bunch of dudes from Jersey making up stories this is what it sounded like oh yeah we jumped off this 20-foot cliff and that was a ride it didn't feel real <laughs> and as I started looking into it you realize like there wasn't much journalism out there there was like right. a thinly sourced Wikipedia page a couple of weird Jersey articles so I really wanted to talk to people interview people like figure out what was what was real so in 2013 I made a, a short documentary on the topic and then the real story started coming out of the woodwork after then and which brings us to now right so was there there was some footage from a, from 2013 of the son of the founder right is that from yes. your original project yeah, it was unused footage from that short. The family of the uh, the people who ran the park declined to participate in our documentary. Yeah, I, I think for uh, apparent reasons, yes. Right. So, but you did have all that footage, so obviously you could use it because you owned it. So you decided one day, I'm going to make this killer documentary of the killer amusement park. Like, it, So, yeah. So I've been... Um, you know, ever since the short came out, all these stories just started showing up in my inbox. People basically saying, I've got stories to share. And, and so I started accumulating stories and sources and home movies. And I was trying to figure out like, what, what, what was I gonna do with this? And then last April, 2019, I was uh, in Las Vegas, hanging out with my friend, Chris Charles Scott, who is my co-director in the project. And we were just getting a drink and he's a documentary filmmaker. And he was basically like, why haven't you done anything with this? And I was really like, Need, need the right collaborator, need somebody to help me execute this. And we kind of right then and there were like, let's do this. And within two months, we were rolling cameras. Wow. And how'd you get the, per the people who to participate? Like some of the, were the I mean, because there's a girl that's there, I can't remember her name, that she's woven throughout the whole story. Um, do you know well, what I'm so talking all, about? All, there's a, I mean, a bunch of different ways depending on who it was you know some of these are people i've known for years just because i've been researching the topic for so long kind of uh getting in with the world of action park if you will mm -hmm. making friends of people uh getting into like the secret vernon new jersey facebook groups all that kind of thing uh so it was really just the result of years and years and years of relationship building in different capacities depending on who it was yeah it's just wild nick definitely wild what's your favorite ride if you had to pick one ride, Nick, which would it be for you have to gone on? Nick? Nick. Yeah, what no, ride I'm talking Nick. Yeah. I don't know. I would say, I mean, the Alpine Slide would probably scare the fuck out of me. I know me as a kid. Like, I'd bail after like, the first hundred feet. I'd be like, that's it. I'm done. But, but Nick, considering that, how dangerous everybody knew the Alpine Slide was and they still went on it, you have to imagine that was some fun stuff, though. It probably was fucking <laughs> crazy. It probably was nuts. I mean, that – Yeah. I've only gone – like, like that water slide that does the loop around, like, that just seems horrifying. 
Like I, I've gone on like water slides and things where you drop straight down and you feel like there's nothing there. And then you just go into a pool or whatever, like Atlantis and Bahamas when I was very little, I went there and did that. But like the scariest ride for me, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rye Playland. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the dragon coaster old as shit. And it's like made of wood that used to fucking horrify me as a kid. Cause you know, you're slowly creeping up and you just hear all the wood creaking and like, it's like the cycle. park was like the, yeah, the park started in like 1918 or some shit. And you're like, Oh no, this is it. But that was probably the scariest everybody, one for me. Everybody growing up had their kind of local, all those people are like, Oh, it's just like this place I grew up in. Everybody's got their local action park. I think, you know, that's what makes the story so interesting to people who aren't from New Jersey is because yeah it's kind of a relatable, relatable experience if you grew up in this era, either going to some rickety old amusement park or kind of making these adventures in your own way. You know, it's like an era of minimal adult supervision. There's no cell phones. Kids were kind of left to their own devices. And if you weren't going to Action Park, you might have been like building ill-advised BMX ramps or right. breaking into mental hospitals or tunnels or doing all sorts of just stupid self-destructive things. What made Action Park different was it was all that stupid self-destructive stuff within the confines of an amusement park yeah. so you kind of felt like this should be safe but it wasn't what was your favorite like if you were to go on what like what would your ride would you have picked the alpine slide was so interesting because it was so dangerous i mean on a busy saturday literally hundreds of people would be hurt on that ride every yeah. single day hundreds a day and people still kept lining up as the most popular ride there going up because it was so fun and imagine something that's like so fun that despite the fact that you just saw your friend get half his skin just like removed, Typed you're off, still yeah. gonna go do it. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was a fun ride. I I have an affinity to the Colorado River. So good. Right. And such a good ride. I every single time, like there was that one spot in that ride where all the boats would bunch up and you would just get smashed by the boat come, you know, the 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 raft coming in behind you and I flipped every which way hit different things banged heads on other people like it was insane but that's the one that I would I would probably pick every time if I had to pick one like the Alpine yeah, ride is awesome yeah. um I like the wave pools too yeah, the I've wave been pool. in the gray pool I've been in a few of those, like in other places. I, the, actually, the place I did the Alpine Slide and the Wave Pool was in the Poconos when I was a kid. That was like the only, but it was way more. It might have been. Back. Well, Action Park opened up a spinoff in the Poconos called Action Mountain, so it might have been that. I got to, well, my grandmother's <laughs> dead, so I can't ask her, but we got to, <laughs> I want to figure the, that out. The Wave Pool, I mean, you could talk about every ride and be like, yeah, the Wave Pool is so dangerous, and or the, the circle thing was like every fucking thing you did in that place, yeah. you were taking the your life. The Wave Pool had a, sec they had a section known as the Death Zone, like yeah. where you, with shoulder height water, the waves that start go over you, and if you didn't know how to swim, and like a shocking number of people at Action Park had no idea how to swim, yeah. you just get pulled under. And I, people were totally caught off guard. Yeah. And so the chair overlooking that was called the death chair. Right. And they'd haze. They'd break in lifeguards by placing them there. And they knew in the first like half hour, they'd have a half dozen saves. It's just wild. Yeah. I just remember like not wanting to go in that water because it's, I was, I, it was I just, disgusting. it was gross. Disgusting. Like it was disgusting. definitely it was the biggest bathroom at the place. And it was so dangerous. Like you could just feel going in that pool how dangerous it was what like, year did you go to action park do you think <laughs> oh man i went to action park definitely all through the mid 80s i went to college okay. in 1988 right so my action park was probably 83 to 87 like those were a heck years. of a time to go to action park I yeah would, so you were probably there right when it was blowing up but before they had built the proper infrastructure to deal with the massive crowds. So what that means is that all the bathrooms, all the toilets are just constantly overflowed. Yeah. Like they had this big problem because suddenly they start running TV ads and people start coming in by the bus load, like 15,000 a day. They had like a million visitors in the year and they had like four toilets, you know? So the whole place was just disgusting. So people would go, anywhere they could find like in the that grottos by some of the pools yeah and there was just like shit everywhere yeah. um they had to hose down the alpine slide because people were just like shitting on the alpine slide when they were going down um one empl former employee told me like the 
they will never forget like the traumatized the most intense smell they've ever had it was they had to go clean out the grotto area near the roaring roaring springs thing and it was just they walk in and it's like a biohazard site you know just like can't use it it was like 14 year old kids yeah Wow. Maybe the bathroom is the scariest ride there. That would the bathroom be. is the scariest ride. Yeah, it's funny because yeah. my I, I went two ways. My parents, like the moms, would all say, "Oh, we'll take the kids to Action Park today." So, like four moms would take four kids, and we'd all go to Action Park. And then the other way is I went to town summer camps all through you know my my grammar school, and then not so much in high school, but grammar school and you know middle school. So we would go to summer camp, and they would do day trips to Great Adventure and all these different places and action park was on the trip schedule every single year bus loads of summer camp kids just getting yeah. dropped off there with two high school counselors and just to run fucking wild right. yeah. <laughs> every long. summer camp every summer camp in that area would go yeah. to action park 100 percent. and yeah. so like the parents yeah like the parents it's not even like i have to convince my parents to go this camp's just dropping you off right just dropping you off i asked my mom yeah. over the weekend i'm like mom i i I have to because she's still alive. I'm like, I got to ask you a question. We're, we're talking to the guys that put together this, and she had no idea that documentary exists, but she obviously remembers Action Park. And I'm like, what do you remember about Action Park? And she was like, I don't know. It seemed fun. Like you kids liked it. <laughs> I was like, I was, I was also, like, parenting, obviously, I wasn't around yet. I was born in 88, but like parenting was a little different. In yeah, yeah. 70s and 80s. Yeah. It was more like, get the fuck out of here, come home for dinner, and that's it. Like, but I was curious. Yeah. I'm like, did you realize how dangerous of a place that was when you would take us there or let us go on camp? And her answer was, no, I didn't. And I'm like, that blows my mind because the kids all knew that this was a little bit off, like when you're there. Yeah. Like, this is a little more fun than going to Great Adventure. Like, or, or Disney World or Universal or anything like that. Did either of you guys, of either of you guys suffer any injuries while at Action Park? I did not. I, I mean, I don't have any injuries. Like, I just remember getting banged around on that, that roaring rapid okay. ride. Like, not. But you'd see them. Yeah. You'd walk oh, around the park totally. and you would see people. Yeah. So, yeah. so the Alpine Slide, the most infamous injury was the Alpine Slide, like friction burn. And they take you to that like shady infirmary shack. They'd spray you with this bizarre orange substance that was alcohol and iodine put you in a circle. If you manage to stay in the circle while they sprayed you, you won a prize. Nobody ever stayed in the circle. They had no prize ready. So they had to like give you a pen if that happens. Uh, I think uh, Judd Apatow tweeted that the screaming in 40 year old virgin when Steve Carell gets his chest wax was inspired from the screaming from that spray. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So it's, so you'd see people walking around and you'd have just like orange sprays over these open wounds and they'd just be going into the pools next to you, like everywhere. And you just remember thinking like, that's not sanitary, man. That's messed up. And it's just wow. everywhere you look. Yeah. It's wild. So oh, what, um, like, what's your background? Are you, I mean, you mentioned you did shorts. Are you a filmmaker? Like what's, what's. Journalist. Like, journalist. Journalist. Yeah. And what, like you specialize in any, in any specific kind of journalism? Yeah. I was a magazine editor for, for years, um, mostly technology journalists. So I, I worked at like Popular Mechanics. I worked at Maxim Magazine for a number of years. Uh, Call us a bunch of places. I had to suck, Maxim. <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> no. And that's why I first started Super getting boring. interested in like, in like exploring Action Park from a journalistic perspective was working at places like Pop Meg and Maxim. Right. I could totally make an Action, action Park story at those places. So yeah. that was sort of my first like excuse to really start researching it rigorously. Right. So is this, this is the first major thing that you've, you've put first, out? First feature. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And what, is it something that you're going to continue to pursue? Is more? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've got a bunch of others lined up. You should do one on Nick Scopoletti. Sell me Nick. Horrifying. Let's do it. That'd be, that'd be horrifying. What do you want to know? He's trying to figure out a lot of stuff. It should be, <laughs> should be on film. Sells just itself. Saying, I'm not pitching you. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that there, there could be some interesting camera work. <laughs> uh, a lot of POV. So, so like what, you know, through this experience, I mean, it's, I imagine this is one of the more popular things on HBO Max right now. Yes. Like what are they, they, what they, are they, they telling you? Well, they, they, they put out a press release saying it was, uh, you know, at least for the first week it was out, it was the number one movie on the platform and the number three piece of content after uh, Lovecraft Country and John Oliver. So that's wow. like kind of a humbling honor, you know, like wow. that's cool. Yeah. So it's like, take that Game of Thrones. 
Yeah. <laughs> Take that Sopranos. <laughs> Especially that last season, man. Everyone fucking hated yeah. it. Just beat you guys once again. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's surreal. It's weird. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's weird because like, you know, this movie came out was three weeks ago and we're all kind of locked in. So like the only thing that's changed in my life is my Twitter feed is a little busier, <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's such a weird, such a weird experience, but it's, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine. So what, what's like, are they, is HBO Warner giving you like other opportunities now that this is so successful? Or are they asking you what else is up in that crazy mind of, of your guys? Well, I don't think those conversations have happened yet because we're still, uh, we're still in the thick of this, you know, we're still like riding this wave. Um, it'd be cool. I think I, I'd love to work with them again. It was such a positive experience. Like did they, no complaints. Did, did you, so did you go in and sell them on the idea or did you do the whole thing and then take it to them and say, Hey, here's our finished project. Do you want it? Yeah. We made the movie first. So we totally self-produced this film. Uh, oh. Our initial attention was kind of like the standard independent film thing. If we're going to make a movie, we're going to take it to some film festivals. Right. We're going to hope people notice it and hope something happens, but no promises. Right. COVID happened. All the festivals like went virtual, got canceled. So that whole plan just got scrambled. Uh, so we were just super lucky that we had gotten a fair bit of attention because the topic of Action Park is so awesome and sticky and everything that we put a trailer out. And it led to a pretty lengthy feature in the, the New York Times, which right. is really cool. Yeah. And uh, so from there, it was pretty easy to kind of have some conversations. Right. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. congratulations. It's obviously, Thank you. I, don't, I think to anyone who watches, it's not just people that grew up around New Jersey going or knowing of this place. I mean, it's, it, it's a holy fuck that exists. Like, yeah. Really it scrambles really your brain. It, yeah. it like I think and, and right now it's such an interesting time for it to come out because like you know COVID wasn't on our mind when this right. came out but it's something that's so easy to like draw parallels to anything in which like a system seems to fail us I guess the way of putting it or the forces of fun come up against the forces of staying alive right. you know which is like I think in, in a nutshell a lot of what we're all kind of thinking with and dealing with right now and so it's become this like amazing catch-all metaphor or allegory for anything from like should we wear masks to the you know this capitalism failing us like whatever you want it to be uh and for us when we went into it like those things explicitly weren't on our mind what was more in our mind was trying to unlock and unravel this this weird mystery we kind of found which is why is it that the people who grew up in this like 1980s latchkey totally unsupervised uh, upbringing are now like the most micromanaging helicopter parents there are like what happened to them that caused that shift right. and I think like yeah and so like Action Park or whatever your version of Action Park was right. I think really explains it because you start realizing that these people look back super fondly at their upbringing and they wouldn't trade it for the world but they all saw some shit they all saw some things that were terrifying yeah. that they're like I, I never want my kids to go through that it's really oh, it, it is true and yeah. Nick, Nick, you know, grew up in a different time than me, who was in that time. And I remember, like, I would get home from school, and I would get on my bike, and I would drive seven miles on my bike to the next town's record store, spend all afternoon at the record store, and then once it got dark, I would drive home another seven miles. So I just rode 14 round-trip miles to go to a record store to buy Slayer. You're in good shape, at least. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I was in good shape, basically, yeah. Um, you know, and now if my kids said, hey, and he has, I have two teenagers and they've, they've said to me, I'm going to ride my bike to the next town, which is like a mile and a half, you know, and they're like, oh, we're going to go fish. And I'm like, how far is it? And they're like, it's three miles. I'm like, I'll drive you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just it. And, and just trying to understand like why that pendulum shifted so hard. Yeah. And I think really like it's something that I haven't really seen explored anywhere, which is that you know, no matter how um, much you loved your childhood, if you really grew up in that setting, you experienced some trauma. You saw some, you lost a friend, you know, like I can't tell you like how many people I know who died young due to stupid, stupid yeah. shit. Yeah. And it's like, man, I would do like anything to keep, if I, I don't have kids, but if I did like to keep that from happening to them. Right. Oh yeah. My, uh, my dad, he's 70 now. But he, I mean, he graduated high school in 1968. And as soon as he graduated, he left and went on the road with his buddies in a band for like six years. Like just totally. And then when I came home from college, well, fast forward, I'd be going out every weekend and he'd be like, where are you going? And I'd be like, going out, like, you know, same place. Like, who's going to be there? And I'm like, really, dude? Like, what? <laughs> you were on the road in a band in the 70s doing drugs. I'm here. 
and I'm going out with the same people you know, just my friends. Yeah. And he's like, I was like, why are you like this? And he, and he, he knows goes, what awful things. Yeah. yeah, he just go, but he goes, I don't know. I'm turning into my mother. This is bad. That's what he always used to yeah. say. It's just how it happens. Though. It just change. Each generation's different. Like the generation before yeah. my dad, they grew up like Great Depression. They like, you know, they were poor. So my dad started to ball out in the eighties, thought he was cool, spending all this money and all materialistic shit, but it just changes. Everyone, every generation has a different thing, but now for sure parents are, I have all my buddies are parents now of like really little ones, like three and four year olds. And it's very different. Such a different time. Yeah. I mean, it's, and technology changes it too. That I too. I mean, kids. like you yeah. see, a, you see a three-year-old knows how to, iPad, iPhone, like knows exactly like deleting apps. I'm like, Jesus Christ. So it's it's crazy. my mom to this day. If I went and stayed at my mother's house for a weekend, if I, I, this is no lie. If I go out at night, she will sit up until I get home to this day. My mom did that every time I left my house when I was in high school, college, an adult, a married person staying at home. And like if I went out, she would wait up for me. Right. And then yeah. when I got home, she would make sure she came in and say goodnight to me. And I, I took that as like, I can't really get away with anything because my mom is checking on me when I get home from wherever the hell I was at 25, 28, 30, 40 years old. Right. To this day, I leave my mom's house. She asks me to call her when I got home to make sure I get home. Okay. I'm a hundred years old. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the Not 80s, uh, but she if never Ferris Bueller is the... Never, like, <laughs> it wasn't about, like, she was fearful that I was doing something dangerous while I was out. Like, I could, I was at Action Park. Didn't even think twice about it. She just wanted to know when I got home. Yeah. You That's know. why all Ferris Bueller had to do is put, like, a dummy with a snoring exactly. tape loop. And it's fine, you know? It's like, oh, he's there. <laughs> Done. <laughs> such a different time dude that blows my mind you're like what what's surprising you out of this whole experience everything um i didn't i mean when i made the short and when i first started researching this i didn't really understand action park i don't think many people really do um how how truly crazy the place was but also how they were able to very methodically kind of skirt regulations and skirt rules and just kind of stay in business. Like it, it's, it was this you know, 1970 to 1996 and that whole time they're just playing fast and loose with the law, with regulations and basically playing a game of, of chicken with regulators where they're just saying like, we're just going to do our things way, your, our way. What are you going to do about it? And realizing that like the systems of government are so slow. So Maybe they didn't have insurance this year. By the time the government files any paperwork around it, the season's already over. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff. What are you going to do about it? So the owner actually created a fake insurance company yeah. in the Cayman yeah. Islands uh, in order to stay in business, but not content to just have that be a way to avoid paying insurance premiums. He also used that to launder money because yeah. if you're going to have a scheme, it might as well do, you know, do something else for you yeah. too. Do um, but everything, man, like the place was wild. It was just yeah. truly wild. And the owner, you know, I, I got really interested in this idea that, amusement parks and theme parks in particular are kind of like the manifestations of some like auteur or individuals like yeah. world like a petri dish for how they want the world to be uh and you know like look at like walt disney wanted some salt wanted like this weird turn of the century fantastical universe like a place where nothing could ever hurt you that's what disneyland was the owner of action park gene mulvett hill he had this idea we say we say somewhere between um ayn rand and lord of the flies like this libertarian utopia where there were no rules and people might get hurt but at least you can have a good time yeah and it just struck me as such a weird concept um trying to understand that it was really rough yeah i'll tell you what i what i found really interesting in in the in the documentary in the movie is that the woman i can't remember her name but she was the journalist from new jersey right yeah jesse really didn't you know most of her relationship with him the owner was terrible and bad until yes. I guess the very end of his life when I guess she got to spend a little more time with him or a different type of time or conversations. And her, her position was at the end was very surprising to me. Like it wasn't, he's the worst person ever. She was like, he's not the worst person ever. And he's not the greatest person. He's somewhere in between, which is probably true for most people, but yeah. out of, the whole experience with how he you know handled the park and the injuries and the lawsuits and all that stuff, I was very surprised at that. 
Yeah, I think that caught a lot of people off guard. People, I think, wanted our movie to kind of like say, this was a bad man, like a villain. But I kind of view it as almost like a a Socratic movie where, you know, we're going to kind of lead you to the precipice of making up your own mind. And then you take that final step yourself. Um, And and Jesse, the woman who you're talking about, she basically told us, she said, if you only include the bad things that I have to say about Gene, you have manipulated my interview. This right. is what she said. like like my my point of view of him is much more complex and nuanced than that. And she said like if if I see that this movie and there isn't this bit in there, I will feel like you are lying. And right. we felt like we had an obligation to you know tell the truth, even if it's a complicated yeah. truth, because I think people really want it to be much more cut and dry. Right. Well, it was it was complicated to understand that whole perspective after how yeah. it was led up the whole you know the whole time. But I thought it was it was I don't want to say shocking, but it was surprising. You know, yeah, it absolutely. Really hammered home the entire, you know, point, I think, of the documentary. Well, it's also, it's, I think it's important for people to understand, like, how these people can consolidate power and how they can get away with these things. It's not because they're unlikable people, you know, like, these people who are managed to do these things, there's something about them that people are, are drawn to. There's something about them that people like. And we need to acknowledge that and understand that or else it just becomes this very like you know it's Lex Luthor suddenly doing his bad stuff like no Lex Luthor is probably a nice guy who had loyal henchmen you know you need to understand how that works yeah for sure wild man um, this is uh I, I can't wait to see right, right. I would, I've just been yeah. watching uh clips and like seeing little things yeah. here and there I'm gonna sit down and watch this thing tonight but I can't believe it it's pretty uh it's pre- did the fact that you got Greg so riled up I don't see him get riled up ever like he was so like dude you gotta like called me and I was like all right man. like calm down <laughs> watch like, this movie yeah I said, like I did all the research for him because I knew he doesn't have HBO Max so I went on to yeah down to all the, the old stuff and I'm like just just watch these five clips and you will totally <laughs> understand the thing that blows me away too is the guy that got fucking electrocuted and had a heart attack oh yeah <laughs> like the kayak the experience yeah, yeah like, like live wires in water what are we doing so the photo the fuck? yeah the photo the photo we have of that ride, the kayak experience, that's the first photo I've ever seen anywhere of that ride. The ride wasn't open long before that happened. And, you know, if you look at like any articles, but actually nobody has any photos. That one showed up in our inbox pretty late in production and it was dated. And the date that picture was taken was the day the dude got electrocuted and killed, wow. him, which is just wild. Yeah. Totally. So, um, what's coming up for you? Like, what, what are you doing next? What are you working on? Like, what can what you I'm talk doing? about? I feel like you gotta be seen. Yeah. You, you know <laughs> how it is. Oh, all these things I can't talk about. Uh, you know, right now I'm really just, I'm still riding the action park high. Like it's been such like a multi year journey expedition. Uh, and to get, to get it now to this place where people can see it. It's, you know, it's, it's a dream man. it's awesome. Uh, so still like, just, it's not real. It's surreal. It's yeah. great. Colorado River Ride, your favorite ride there. You ever see any fights break out? I, you know, I heard when you guys talked about that in 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 the doc. Yeah. I don't recall seeing fights, <clears throat> but there was a lot of aggression. Like, yeah, the, the ride, that, my favorite thing, and I didn't realize until we did the interview, is the owner didn't want any lifeguards on that ride because the real Colorado River doesn't have lifeguards right yeah right <laughs> so it's, it's like the that real colorado river, river yeah he's literally like he was like we don't i don't want any like when I mean, you're in the real colorado river there's not some kid in a lifeguard shirt pushing in your raft and um it's like deputy basically had to say like this isn't the colorado river it's a water park <laughs> uh, and i was explaining to nick when i first started telling him about this and i'm like i want to you know i, I dm'd the 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 account and the director got back to me like we got to have these guys on and he's kind of looking yeah. like i'm kind of crazy and then I, i'm like let me just explain to you this one ride you go down a water slide you do a massive loop and then it shoots you out about 20 feet in the air into a freezing cold pool at the bottom and that's the ride and he was like yeah. i'm in <laughs> yeah creative i mean it was i think the thing that's largely often overlooked about action park when people like look at these crazy rides is is kind of its place in the history of water parks it was one of the first three or four water parks in the country you had like wet and wild you had schlitterbahn you had disney's river country you had action park so it was just by nature of, of being that early to the game experimental like nobody knew what a water park was they had to try a bunch of ideas 
kind of seeing what would work. You couldn't just like go to an industry convention and buy a bunch of off the shelf water slides. They were making them up as they, as they went along. So they basically get the, they call them the mountain men, the people who basically worked on the ski resort. Cause this was a summertime attraction on what was a ski resort in the winter, a way to capitalize on that because the ski season is really short in New Jersey. You need to make money in the summer. And so these guys would just start building these crazy ideas. A lot of them came from the brain of the owner or just some kooks who just had a random idea. Nobody was an engineer. Um, it was basically like a much bigger version of your weird cousin who builds like a skateboard ramp and shouldn't be doing that. You know, it was all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's wild. So, I mean, I don't, I, I could talk about this for so many hours, but I think we're going to probably wrap up on thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real, man. This Appreciate is, it. Uh, making this movie um, and bring, make, bringing it back to the forefront of so many minds of fucked up kids yeah. like me. Who, <laughs> um, you want, you want, you want one last story that wasn't 100%. in the movie before we go? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, okay. So this, this tells you, I think a lot about the owner of the park. So in the movie, we briefly reference, we have a security guard who tells us about how he had heard that the owner of the park kept a Mac 10 machine gun in his desk. <laughs> the full story, which was cut because it just went on way too long, right. was he actually broke into the office of the owner in order to find this machine gun with the intention of like doing target practice, playing around with it, shooting up some cans. When he got there, the gun was not there. What I found out just a couple weeks ago, speaking to another owner after the movie came out, was why the gun wasn't there. This other employee and some buddies of his had the exact same idea, had broken into the office, found the gun, shot up a bunch of stuff, stole all of his ammo, and one of them had stolen the gun. So wow. that's why the gun wasn't there. Wow. So Nick's face right now, I want to bottle that. <laughs> <laughs> He wants to know where the gun is. He's still, he's just trying yeah. to figure out where the gun is. It's like, it's fucking, game of dude, dude, this, uh, it's, it doesn't sound real, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> like if I didn't no. know Greg personally, I'd be like, oh, come on. Really? This was a place, no. but. Are you going to, are you all sorts of, of, of writing this into a, into a, um, a nonfiction, I mean, a fiction story? I think there's clearly, I think potential there. I w I'm not um, really sure if, if if but i'd love to see that happen you know yeah. i think it absolutely is there's a lot of ways that it makes somewhere happen, between like wet hot american summer and friday and the wire yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the friday 13th. it's or like the sopranos meets wet i was gonna say summers. the sopranos yeah, yeah. Oh, the <laughs> Gotta be. well listen dude i really appreciate the time uh, yes Seth, thank this you. was great man i can't wait to watch this fucking thing just really all the success like this is great all our appreciate it you're talking about it. it it's it's a riot like really and for sure keep in touch you know we're going to keep an eye on this and obviously as things develop with what you're doing you have an open invitation to come back and shoot the shit with us anytime anytime absolutely taking right. you up on that thank you guys very much thanks and then when this is all over we'll go on a really dangerous roller coaster together yeah. somewhere drive really fast yeah even if we have to make it ourselves yeah 100 yes that's exactly. even better <laughs> All right, Seth. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.